Welcome to CISO's Insiders Podcast, powered by GRC Consulting. In this podcast, we'll be interviewing leading CISOs and security leaders in the industry for light, eye-level conversations. Here, they share advice and tips, talk about their biggest accomplishments and failures, favorite drinks, key influencers, and much more. We encourage you to walk away with at least one insight that will help you better yourself or your business. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more content, please check us out on social media. Uh, today, I will be speaking with Eric Adams. Um, so a bit about Eric. Eric, uh, from the little research that I was able to do, Eric comes from a very technical background. He started off as a tech consultant over at HP. I think one of, our, one of his expertise was around PKI. Uh, security architecture, uh, you know, at some point, uh, yeah, I think he started doing a lot of work around FedRAMP, uh, ISO, possibly, uh, probably ISO 27001 and CSA compliance. CSA, uh, I believe that's Cloud Security Alliance. Uh, and um, at some point, I, I believe after the, the m and um, after HP actually acquired Fortify, I think this is when he started managing that program, but maybe maybe I'm I'm, I'm butchering something here. Um, You're uh, close. <laughs> he, he then spent uh, about two and a half year p- period at uh, over at IBM as the chief federal uh, strategist and architect, before moving to his current role at uh, as a full time CISO at a company called I want to say Kiriba. Yes. Okay. And Correct. again, I'm. I'm sure I missed out on a lot of, of, of aspects. So if you wanna, you know, just do a quick intro, that would be great. Yeah, no, that's pretty accurate. So I uh, worked for HP for about 20 years, various security positions within HP, uh, started very customer facing, uh, then uh, grew into more of the IT data center roles. That was early on when HP and Compaq were merging together. So it was through a lot of that data center consolidation and all of the security um, things that were going on in the back end. And then uh, after that, you know, got into uh, imaging and printing group, which was very, the, one of the largest divisions within HP. And that was uh, in my hometown area of Boise, where we have a large HP campus. And um, after that, got into federal and then beyond federal enclaves with federal cloud security uh, with a Fortify group, which was an acquisition into HP as static code analysis. Uh, so yeah, very good uh, time with HP. And then, like you said, afterwards with IBM as the FedRAMP federal cloud strategist for IBM Watson and Cloud, and then joining Kariba as the CISO. And I've been at Kariba for almost three years. Here in next month will be three years, yeah. Okay, that, that's a nice, uh, I mean, that's an interesting career uh, p- path that you took, um, you know, moving from the vendor side to the, well, I mean, HP could be considered probably as a vendor and uh, as a corporate as well, right? Um, but yeah, uh, yeah and, and you've had, uh, so I'm assuming you have a lot of experience with the 45 with, with static analysis. I, I actually onboarded 45 pro- probably 12 years ago into one of the companies that I was working for at the time. I'm sure they had, you know, a lot of changes since then, but. Um, yeah, it's a great product. It's awesome. And then of course the cloud version too, it's very good. It's a good yeah. product. Yeah, they didn't have that uh, 12 years ago, but uh, as far as I remember, uh, but great. And uh, thank you for the, for the intro. I always like to start off with a couple of quick icebreaker questions here. Um, What's your marital status, if you would be willing to share? And what's your favorite drink? Yeah, so I'm married, uh, have uh, kids here, of course. Their youngest one is uh, in, just started high school, uh, one in college, one um, that is in the career field. So, um, yeah, uh, favorite drink. I would say water right now. I'm really into drinking a lot of water, probably because it's getting near springtime after winter time of, you know, eating too much food. And so I'm trying to drink as much water as I can. Um, so tall glass of ice water is, is always good. Um, yep. So yeah, I mean, um, I think that's pretty much it. Kind of boring, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised. Boring is good. 
I, you'd be surprised I got uh, the same answer from a couple of CISOs. One one mentioned milk was his favorite drink. So yeah, yeah I'm I'm, very, I'm not judging. Uh, <laughs> so let's dive right in. Uh, what's the one thing you wish you'd known before you began your career? Oh wow! Uh, you know, I I would say that <clears throat> one thing that you wish you'd known. So really early on, you're afraid to make mistakes. And I would say that if you knew starting out, it's okay to make mistakes, just don't make too big of mistakes, right? But really learn from your mistakes and understand um, that you can use that later on to navigate a more efficient and correct path. So really, it's okay to make small mistakes, you should calculate the risks, of course, before doing anything, whether it's major or a minor thing. And when you do have something that you might make a mistake with under, you know, learn from it and be able to make it better the next time. So I, I would say that that's probably it. And being able to make the proper course of correction from any, any type of mistake. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's interesting because this topic uh, comes up a lot uh, in my discussion. Um, so, and, and I'm, I'm a, I think I'm a fan of, of making mistakes and failing as long as, as you said, I mean, I prefer to fail small, not to fail big, right. but I right. think like personally, I think you learn so much more from the, from your mistakes and failures than, than from your accomplishments, because, you know, when you get a win, so, you know, you just got to win and, and, you know, you, you usually move on. You usually do not stop to pause and, you know, to, to, and, and reflect on it. But w when you fail, this forces you, I mean, it forces you into a corner and you have to adjust and you have to learn from it. At least that's, I mean, that's my experience. Um, yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. So like the Super Bowl in football, for instance, like most of the teams don't win every game of the season and then win the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. They win the majority of the game so that they can get in the playoffs and then, of course, win in the playoffs and then win the Super Bowl. That's their ultimate goal. So they're going to lose some games along the way, but they learn from them. They go back and they watch the video. They learn what they could do better. And then those are more minimal mistakes in the overall goal. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're in agreement here. Uh, but could you name like uh, a single biggest failure or biggest mistake that that you, that you could say, wow, I really learned something from that? Yeah, I would say not really failure, but more of an opportunity. So um, I know that working with very large companies, it's hard to communicate cross-departmentally. And that's one of the things I established within, within HP during building Federal Cloud was really knowing a lot of these people in these other organizations, or at least knowing the people who knew them to be able to get linked up to them. So that was a good thing. Now, um, I would say going from that large company to another large company to IBM, I didn't really have a lot of those linkages. And I would have say, said, looking back at that, um, I would have liked to establish more of those linkages somehow, like gotten better at it at a shorter time in order to get a few of the really key um, items established that were really important. So things like um, with finance, for instance, um, when looking at projects and where to spend money and where it was very important, also strategically aligning with some of the business development managers and managers of personnel to get everyone together rather than just trying to build something like, let's say, building a cloud system, um, getting everyone in, in alignment to understand why we were doing that and the impact of doing that. I think, you know, looking back at that, it would have probably made a bigger impact if, if that would to have occurred, really. And however, being able to make those linkages is not easy when you just come in as a new person. You really have to try super hard to do it. Um, and so you can't assume that the people that are already there are going to do that for you because they're not thinking what you know in your head has to happen in order for the whole program to succeed. So I would say that it's not really a failure, 
but really opportunity and understanding how all of that works in order to get all of the right people on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and that makes, uh, that makes sense because, uh, uh, running a cybersecurity and compliance program, it's not, you know, solely and uh, the concern of the CISO or the IT department or even the legal counsel. It's uh, It should be a cross-the-board kind of initiative, right? And you have to have the support, not only from the leadership, but also from your peers. And, and I, I get what you're saying. You need to, to be able to communicate that across the board and you need to get support from your peers as well as your leaders. So, uh, I'm, and I'm assuming that that was the, the intent of, what, of of your answer, right? Well, absolutely. And to make a cloud system. So if you have a business unit with a cloud system and you're building it and you're putting it towards a specific um, target customer uh, base, um, you really need that ongoing support of all of those areas and they need to be in alignment for it to be sustainable long-term and to ensure you've got the right components to keep it going at the correct level. So really it's part HR, part finance, um, part, you know, the business unit leadership, all of those pieces have to be in alignment. Yeah. Agreed. And, and, uh, so, and again, you, you talked a bit about your, uh, you know, the, the mistakes and what you can learn from them. Uh, can you, can you name, or is there any like single biggest accomplishment that you're really proud of that, that you wanted to share? Well, I would have to say probably the accomplishment, you know, of building a federal cloud system for HP. And really the reason, the core reason of that was um, working with the personnel at Fort Knox at the U.S. Army. So working as an HP employee, working with both civilians and military personnel um, and training them at the site. And then they're using the product, which is an on-premise product, but understanding that there's a cloud version also, and they can't use that without this authority to operate that government systems have to use. And so really when that started to have a cloud version of authority to operate through the FedRAMP program, that's when I, I looked at it and I said, wow, this paperwork is NIST 853. I'm used to doing this with federal enclaves working in other um, business units for HP, working for CMS.gov and others. And so really it made sense. And so how that made me feel the best was I was able to help um, this customer because they said, look, we'd like to use your cloud system. We would like to get our personnel focused on their core business objectives. And so rather than us having a lot of IT people support the system to you know, buy all these licenses, to um, buy all these systems in order to do it, we'd rather use the cloud version. And so really that made me feel good that I could help them. It was human resources command and they were in charge of a lot of very important systems like notification uh, systems to um, uh, warfighters families. So it was, to me, it was a really big deal. But then also, realizing that we could help other people in government because if we got this first customer um, brought on then we can help all of these other government customers in the same um, scenario and with the same capability need really and so getting that authorized was a was a really big deal it made me feel good and it was very good for the company too it created a whole new basically business unit for the company to be able to sell to u.s public sector yeah, it does sound like a big accomplishment here. Um, and, you know, nowadays, I think uh, the cyberspace, cybersecurity space is, is, very, is very hot. Uh, you know, being a cybersecurity consultant uh, or even a CISO, uh, I, I heard, actually, I heard someone say in one of the conferences a few years back that nowadays CISOs are considered, are uh, equated CISOs to rock stars. I'm not sure I, I agree with that, but uh, it's definitely, you know, uh, perceived uh, much more as a sought after role. Did you, did you want to, um, did, did you want to give any advice to someone wanting to pursue a career in cybersecurity, eventually becoming a CISO? Well, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know if a uh... I would be like a rock star. That sounds like a much more adventurous uh, life than a chief information security officer. But um, I would say really, 
you know, starting out with a path as possibly a security analyst. And really, my path was more building systems and deploying systems. So this is back in the days, you know, 20 years ago in a large enterprise data center, basically having a system engineer rack a system for you and then remotely, well, remotely, it was the building next door, um, building the system and building it to the proper specifications and then doing security hardening and then also ongoing monitoring that system and other systems for security events. That's where kind of it really started. And then myself going into more just security specific roles. However, now, you know, security operations center analysts is a very big um, way to get into security and understanding it. But also I think building security is very important. And that's one of the things that I ended up specializing in, um, especially designing systems for a FedRAMP cloud and understanding, you know, all of the architecture, the VLAN architecture, the software defined networking, um, all of the components that are expected um, by government systems, and then all of the security controls, of course, too, and then how to document and test those. So I think really for a person starting, if you can start into a particular area, but then, um, you know, a good thing is to, if you have an opportunity and raise your hand and say, yeah, I would like, I would like to learn how to do that other thing that you need help with, you know, volunteer for other parts. And that's really how I was able to, I guess, grow, you know, 20 years or so ago is to volunteer to do a lot of these extra things, not just do what was with within my comfort zone. And then also with wanting to be a, a chief information security officer, really understanding and thinking about risk. So everything is risk-based. There's so many resources that you have to um, counteract risk and understanding how to balance those and what is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, you, you described the transition from you know being very technical, being an architect, being able to build security, and by doing so, having to understand uh intimately like the security components the architecture the you know all this all the tiers like the application tier the network tier and so on but you know the then making a transition at some point from that world and then being able to talk about risk and being able to talk about the business i think that's uh, um do you have any insights around that like how to make that transition because i i, I believe uh, you, you can, you know, you can, t I talk to a lot of CISOs and you have all kinds of CISOs. Do you have those who grew up from, you know, from being IT professionals, from being hackers, from all kinds of of security security domains. But but then, you know, like how to make the transition in, in such a way that you, on one hand, you'll be able to, to I mean, to still hold your baseline of, of knowledge, but, but on the other hand, to be able to talk to leadership. Does that make sense? I mean. No, it completely makes sense. And one of the things, and I have to thank HP for this, they paid for me to go to school while I was at HP to get my MBA. And so understanding a lot of those business components and what other people were interested in, in these other business units. So, you know, CFO looks at things like, statement of cash flows, um, balance sheet, all of these things. And so all of these IT things are a cost. And so when you're doing budgeting and planning, it rolls up, it goes into your costs, your ongoing costs, any new costs. Um, and so understanding how, how all of that works at the business level is very interesting to me to understand um, what type of security controls to evaluate, what, what gaps there are being able to do that testing and saying, okay, well, we're pretty good in this area. Here's something that we found maybe we could do better. Meeting with vendors, understanding what is available, seeing if we really need it or not, if there's any overlap. <clears throat> and then also working with that business side to say, okay, we think we need to procure this. Let's approach finance. Let's put it in our budget for yearly budget and planning, be able to explain it, explain more the business side of it, but knowing the technical side. I think that for me, that's really good because early on having a technical foundation and then learning more of that business side really helped. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and um, and I, let's talk a bit about uh, in the cybersecurity or information security structure, like the, the organizational structure. So some companies, in some companies, the CISO reports to uh, an IT function, might be the CIO, might be the CTO. In others, the C CISO might be reporting to uh, a different executive. What's your, do you have any thoughts about like the pros and cons of, uh, of, of a CISO that's actually a part of the ID organization, anything like around, you know, conflict of interest or anything around that? Well, <clears throat> good point. Um, in my organization, so I report into the CEO and that makes sense in some organizations. Maybe it doesn't make sense. In our fintech industry, um, I think that it does make sense because of separation of duties and conflicts of interest, um, definitely. In fact, we have a, a partner that did a security program assessment, asked about that reporting. It makes sense in our industry. So I, I think that that uh, it does make sense. But it again, it depends on what type of industry you're in, what the company structure looks like, how it's designed, what type of product or service that you're selling. It, ju it, it just depends on those factors. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's insightful. We actually, actually, uh, we we do have a few customers in the fintech space. Some of them report into IT functions, others do not. But yeah, I, I I guess you're right, and I guess it also goes back to the to the company's culture and you know and, and openness maybe, and uh, I think mostly around culture. But that's just just my assumption here. <laughs> um, and. Um, so, and you mentioned you went to, I mean, at some point you, you went, uh, you went to school, uh, but I'm, I'm also assuming as, you know, as being part of this industry, a lot of the, a lot of the, the professionals in this industry, the, there are self learners as well. Did you, I mean, can you name a few best resources that have helped you along the way? I mean, was it school? Was it Google? Was it, uh, was it colleagues and mentors? I would say it was people and you're right. You can learn different things in school. You can learn how case studies work, how things work by the book. Um, but really, um, I would have to say that experience and then learning from some of those people who really can give you that experience. And you look back and you say, wow, look at all I learned because I followed the pattern of that person and I realized, you know, it's successful or for them and I understood I understood how it was successful for them and I asked them a lot of questions so one person in mind is uh, doing the FedRAMP project was an information security manager um, in charge of the infrastructure as a service the IAS stack which in the cloud world is the cloud data center and understanding how that base component was put together and how they documented, tested it, got it through accreditation, and then understood how the SaaS layer was intended to be put on top of that. So asking a lot of these questions and asking about, okay, how do we do this and work with government? Because we were working with some of the highest level government personnel in Washington, DC. We were working with the DHS, the DOD, the GSA, having meetings with them. And really this person, um, on the IAS stack was already doing that. And so learning from that person was really crucial. So there's been a few really crucial people along the way to, I guess, learn from and understand those particular things that made them successful and do a lot of research and figure out how to make it su successful for yourself. Hmm. Okay, and, and this actually leads me to my next question. Do you have any specific individuals in mind you wanted to name here? And I would I would understand if, if those names are, are like uh, confidential. <laughs> well, and I don't want to, you know, embarrass somebody if they saw this. What, uh, I'll just give a first name. So Marilyn was a, a very big leader in that, in that particular space. Um, also, I would have to say um, some, some of the leaders in our uh, other, Cybersecurity spaces were, you know, very influential. Uh, some that work at other places now, like AWS and others. Um, some very technical, some very business-minded. Um, yeah, extremely influential who are doing other things. Uh, some that work at Apple, 
So it, you know, kind of dispersed after working on the mm -hmm. HP land since the company was, uh, I guess, split up into smaller companies. A lot of people went elsewhere, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people along the way that have been very helpful uh, to understand how they were successful and how they accomplished that. Sure. Fair enough. Um, is there any uh, one common myth about your profession or field that you wanted to debunk? Oh, wow. Just one? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you could name more than one. That that we have a magic wand and we can just fix anything, probably. Um Wow, that's an interesting thing. I would say on the opposite of that really is that in this field, we're not just looking at technical security. We're looking at all of these business aspects. And a lot of that includes people, processes, capabilities. It includes a lot of things. And so really we look at these things collectively when we're, looking at a risk-based approach. And, and really everything comes down to risk. Um, risk of an attacker attacking a system. What do they want? Why do they want it? How could they get it? Um, what areas do we have that we really need to protect? And constantly evolving that. So we look at that, we look at the, you know, the impact, we look at various things. We have a lot of tooling to, to look at that helps of course, but then it's a lot of reasoning and human logic that goes into it and communicating with other people in order to get the best, uh, the best results out of it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, I just came back from uh, a, an event around ISO 27001 this morning and I was actually the moderator there and we, we talked about the misconception. One, one of the misconceptions that that is out there and especially i think it's more common around uh smaller companies mostly startups is that the iso 27001 or basically you know any security and compliance and cybersecurity and compliance efforts are basically the it problem and we discussed that specific misconception and you just uh stated the same you know basically i mean it's it's much broader than that you need to be looking at first and foremost that you know processes people uh to understand what what it is that you're trying to protect right and, and then how you go about in protecting it and how you go about in building a a roadmap for 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 keeping it protected so so yeah that makes a lot of sense to me yeah absolutely and IT plays a huge role in it of ensuring that a lot of these capabilities are rolled out and then information security works with IT very closely to ensure that the configurations are what the policies, um, that it meets the policies basically, and then reviewing those policies constantly and ensuring that that's the right level of risk that the company is you know, willing to take. So. I think it is very important to see those as two distinct areas, although they work very closely together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you share, like, uh, in your opinion, what are the main concerns that CISOs nowadays have? Well, the main concerns? <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I've been hearing a lot about, you know, supply chain, but, but you know, it could be any, any number of things. And I'm just trying to, you know, to ask this question re repeatedly when I speak with CISOs? Well, yeah, I mean, some of the recent things, so the solar winds with a supply chain type of attack, and we got a briefing on that very early on, um, being a customer of um, <clears throat> not the solar winds itself, but the uh, uh, company who, I guess, gave the alert on it right away. And understanding more about that, like what are, what are the impacts of that? And um, how could we see similar things and really accounting for, for that type of risk? So luckily having a very extremely mature and capable security operations center, that's one of our first lines of defense and being able to look at logs and anomalies and correlations and all of these feeds that come into our system, artificial intelligence. We have many different types of capabilities um, that we look at, but then really breaking down what that, how that attack work, how it was able to infiltrate. And there's many of these, there's the recent 
Microsoft Exchange uh, on-premise Exchange server um, event that went on too. But just really being in tune with a lot of these things that happen and understanding how you would react to one of these, even if it doesn't affect you, um, understanding how you would how you would work with this. So we at our company we do a lot of not only just penetration testing, <clears throat> but we do red teaming. And we understand and we watch as teams try to break into systems and understand what they're trying to do. And it's very interesting. And sometimes, you know, kind of letting them progress, but knowing where they're at the whole time. And so we do a lot of these target atta targeted attacks and simulations in order to continually get better. And I think that's very important because then we're keeping current, of course, but also we're ensuring that our methodologies are working properly, our processes are working properly, and we know how to react properly. Mm -hmm. and, and you keep testing your security posture, right? Absolutely. And here's the great thing. Um, our CEO and our um, executive level, our board, are extremely um, supportive and really cybersecurity is the number one thing at our events. That's typically our CEO will come out, he'll greet everyone. <clears throat> and that's what he'll say is he'll talk about cybersecurity because in the FinTech world, when you're working with banks and these other large customers and you're working with financial, that has to be your top priority. Mm -hmm. And, you know, can you share a bit about your, uh, your daily routine? Like, What's a typical day looks like for the CISO of, of Kiriba? Oh, wow. Uh, tip, typical day. Okay. I'll have to look at my calendar and see what happened. Um, no, typical. Well, it's interesting. Our company was started in Paris uh, in the early 2000s and then started getting bigger. Got a lot of European customers, which was uh, fantastic. And so having that Paris base and a lot of uh, personnel in Paris, of course, where my time zone is, it's uh, quite a bit earlier. So I get up early. Um, <clears throat> I was used to getting up early, though, working with a lot of East Coast personnel. And I just naturally developed a pattern of getting up super early. So um, I'm typically online and going just after noon sometime when personnel, or just after noon Paris time, I guess, uh, in Europe. So um, I start out working very early. And then I'll take a short break to exercise, get a little bit of food. And then typically my calendar of events starts after that. So um, there's a lot of activities that happen, a lot of recurring meetings that we're looking at risks. Um, some of those flow into ISMS where we have that risk treatment that is part of information uh, security management system of ISO 27001. Uh, we have a lot of other things, looking at newer capabilities, uh, looking at the team activities and projects where we're looking at gaps. Um, and then also things that come up, of course, and uh, working with other teams and also supporting our customers. A lot of customer meetings where they're very concerned about cybersecurity, whether it's prospects or existing customers and uh, understanding their needs as well. So that's a, a typical day. I work pretty long hours because of that schedule. Sometimes I might get a 20 minute nap in about three o'clock local time after all of that, and then continue to work a little bit longer, digging through emails and whatever else has to happen. So going from, I guess, going from uh, European time all the way through uh, Pacific time, it keeps me busy during a typical day. Yeah. Tell me about it. Uh, and did you notice any any uh, trends uh, as a, as they relate to budget planning and you know changes from previous years, like 2020, 2019, 2020, as opposed to 2020, 2021? Yeah. So industry uh, generalization of that um, is, of course, p personnel working remote. And especially in a cloud system, of course, it's different because a lot of people are more concerned with, of course, VPN licenses, number one, ensuring that uh, employees can work remotely safely, um, possibly distributing more laptops, et cetera. Now, our company, we're, we've always been a cloud-based company. We have major offices in Paris and also San Diego, and then other offices in London, Tokyo. Uh, New York and others. So 
<clears throat> really personnel were always equipped to be able to work remotely because they would just go into the office, they had their own laptops and they uh, had their own VPN set up. And uh, so that was already established for us. It wasn't, it wasn't really a huge um, change up except that we couldn't go to the office. Mm -hmm. And also we had a very thorough business continuity plan uh, along with our disaster recovery that was part of our overall information system contingency plan. And we had just really uplifted that capability in 2019 so that when 2020 hit with the pandemic, we were already ready with an externally facing business continuity plan and COVID response right away, which was huge. So that was really good. We must have had some crystal ball somewhere, I guess. Um, <laughs> But I would say it, as part of the question though, really for, for our company, it's not, not a whole lot different. Really we're, I mean, we're, we're looking at opportunities and we're looking at spending in order to enable those opportunities. Our growth is very good. And so that's, we're on this growth path. Um, and of course for cybersecurity, again, looking at any gaps, we have the ISMS that identifies these um, typically they're at the level in the trenches, they get escalated up and we have risk treatment at the, I guess, management level and discuss how we're going to address those, but really not a whole, not a whole lot different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, let's, uh, you know, we, we've come to the second part of this podcast and we'll try to keep it relatively short because I want to be respectful of your time. We have around uh, 10 to 15 mi minutes left here. Um, so uh, a few quick questions about vendors. Uh, if you put yourself in the shoes of a vendor, just for a moment, what is it that you, that you would do when looking to engage with, uh, with a new customer? Certainly. So I see a lot of these um, just come out of the blue quite a bit. And I understand, you know, they're looking to uh, to me and show you something that's a capability that's really good that could help you out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I would say really investigate and look at the company that you're approaching and show how it would help them and really tailor that to what they're doing. So if it's a fintech type customer, how it really applies in the fintech world and really go deep into that and say, hey, you know what? I think this would really help you and here's why. Because you're doing this, you're in this space and I think that if you use this or configured it like this, it would really help you. Yeah, uh, thank you. And you know, I've, I've heard this answer quite a bit lately. And uh, I think there is still a disconnect between uh, how, like the way sales organizations are structured, you know, with having SDRs in place and then account executives. And, you know, uh, it's, I think the, the name of the game uh, mostly is around scale. How can we scale this up? And, and I, you know, I keep hearing the same response. So I'm, I'm thinking the market might need an adjustment here. Um, but thank you for that. Um, so, sure. and you know, let's dive in a bit more about uh, just around vendors. Can you name like one or even more, uh, like the most annoying sales speeches that you've encountered lately? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I get some that are persistent and good for them. You know, they're like, Hey, I've sent you all these messages and a lot of, you know, you don't think people read these and they do, they do read them. They just don't have time to respond to every one of them if they're getting hit with like 20 a day. And mm -hmm. so really you kind of file them in the back of your mind. You say, oh, you know what? I've, I've heard of them. If I had some time, I would go look at their capability. And I, you know, later I, I've had some of these later on, I call them up and I say, yeah, I've heard that someone, you know, someone else in the industry is using your product and I'd like to learn more. So however, some of them, some of the sales pitches are pretty annoying. They're, they're almost like, why are you not reading my email? Am I bothering you? And it's like, no, really, you're not bothering me. It's very informative. Um, I just am reading it and I simply don't have time to respond back right now. So okay, that's how I see it. That, I think you're definitely nicer than the majority of CISOs out there. But uh... <laughs> Probably, I don't know. Um, so what is, it, what is it that you are looking for in a vendor though? Yeah, I mean, good quality. 
be uh, something that either displaces something else and provides better quality at a better price and proven, of course, something that you can actually do a proof of concept or, you know, see material that, that proves that or something that really uh, has a capability that's extremely, I guess, well-performing compared to what's already out there. So um, you see a lot of these up and coming vendors that are, I'm not gonna name any names, but uh, that really do some quality work. And really it's through a lot of their own research, seeing what's already out there and understanding these gaps that other people need. Mm -hmm. And are you referring specifically to, to product types of vendors or also to services, to vendors that provide services? Well, it could be both. Um, typically, this is in products, products that we can use. So software products, typically uh, third-party cloud products, mm -hmm. in which when we do that, we do our own very exhaustive security review to ensure it's something that, that we can actually use. But uh, yeah, typically with uh, products, things that support our security operations center, things that might possibly su support our cloud system, um, there's a variety of things. But really, it's something that really can make our system work better, um, make it more efficient, make it easier for people to use, make it easier for people to maintain and operate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I have a follow-up question on this because, because um, so professional services companies, uh, as opposed to, to, software, to software companies, uh, do you consider the, like, I've heard before that a lot of, uh, a lot of your peers said something along the lines of, uh, you know, they're looking for partners. Basically, they want the partner to be able to grow with them and to support them. Uh, do you think, in your opinion, is that more common uh, when you work with, uh, when, you, when you engage with a professional services company, or is it the same for you? Oh, wow. Um, it just depends. Depends, I guess, if I understand the question right, and also the implementation and how difficult it is to implement. So, I mean, maybe there might be something better where it's done under a professional services arrangement. Um, if it's something that we don't want to manage, that'd be more of an MSSP or something like that. But uh, it, it just depends what it is. We have a variety of different capabilities and we onboard and integrate them differently. Okay, let, let me clarify because I feel I didn't ask the question properly. Uh, if, uh, let's say you have a relationship in place with a with a company that, let's say, does your ISO 27001 audits or, you know, or uh, maybe alignment or, or PCI uh, attestations, do you consider those types of vendors like more li along the lines of partners than the hmm. other vendors that provide software solutions for you? Oh yeah, I get it. Uh, that makes sense now because no, I really do see like say our auditors as trusted partners, although they have that particular, you know, separation of duty as an auditor. They're not, you know, they're not your friend. <laughs> they're not, they're not going to do consulting. I guess I shouldn't say they're not your friend. They're really <laughs> nice people. I, I really like our auditors they are fantastic. They do a good job and they make us better. They really do at the end of the day. If there's findings, those those make us better, and that's that's how I see this as um, continuous improvement. Um, of course, we don't want to find very bad things, so we prepare for those and we make the system as uh, as secure as possible as we possibly can. But uh, yeah, no, I I do see them as as partners really because they are helping us uh, make our system better. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thanks. And uh, do you have any specific, and I know you don't like to name names, so um, we might skip this one, but if, 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 you, if you will be willing to name some names, if you had any other season that you look up for, to, to, you look up to, sorry. Yeah, there have been other ones. I mean, ones that I've worked with at IBM, at HP, even at smaller companies, um, whether it's Bay Area companies, East Coast companies, um, CISOs in government. Uh, it's good to meet CISOs. Just met uh, one last week in government and he was a helicopter pilot and had extremely uh, wild stories that were very entertaining. So it, it just depends. There's a whole network of other CISOs that, uh, that really I look up to and 
usually it's for different reasons because they're they're in different types of markets, different um, you know areas of expertise, and so they're very good at understanding their own business and what's important. And so there's there are quite a few that uh, I've been on different panels. And so I listen to what they say and it's very interesting. And I write down a, a lot of this and some of these things I'm able to interject into what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that's the power of, of community, right? Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the, is there any way our listeners, possibly also vendors can connect uh, with you online in a non-intrusive manner? Oh, certainly. I mean, I'm, you know, people can find me on LinkedIn and a lot of times people will just ask me questions and I will reply to most of them. And if they, if they ask me a question like, Hey, you know, I'm having a problem with this. I think you have this experience. I'll probably give them a general industry type of answer of where they should, what they should do and what they should look for. So certainly I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, there, there are ways that people can connect to me in that non-intrusive uh, manner for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is it one? Is it? Is there one single most important thing to you in your career that you wanted to to name? Wow, I would say you know, and this is true of any company is doing my best job to keep that company safe from cyber risk, and that's that's really the most important thing. And I just focus on that. You know, you see coaches and they they'll say oh wow you're playing like the packers next week or you know who are, whoever's really good uh two games from now and they'll say well no we're just focused on this game this week we're not looking forward into that far you know in advance so really that's the same with me as constantly i'm always thinking about um, different risks that we have at our company and how to protect our company at right at that given time. I'm also thinking about things that we're doing in the future, whether it's new capabilities and any possible risks. So really that's my most important thing is understanding how to protect my company at, at all times. Mm -hmm. Yep. Makes sense. Um, before we, we wrap this up, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, just a quick uh, question I like to ask, uh, if you had unlimited funds, what would you do with your life? <laughs> oh wow you know i don't know i i would probably like try to solve major world problems i'd probably try to go build everyone's bill gates. houses or something maybe not bill gates but <laughs> maybe someone else um i'm not sure what bill gates i see him in the news all the time but i don't have time to watch a lot of news but um i would say you know get involved with helping world problems i guess if it wasn't something like that, a lot of people say, oh, I'd buy my own island in the Pacific or Atlantic or wherever, Caribbean, and I would like build this awesome island. I think I would do the opposite. I would build a ski resort or something like that and just like build mm. a bunch of ski lifts and go skiing. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I've never, I've ne I don't have that problem, so I don't really think about it a lot. <laughs> Got it. I don't think many of us have this problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and last but not least, do, do you have, like, have you listened or read to anything recently that has inspired you and you want to share? Yeah, you know, I'm starting to, well, I've read a few uh, cybersecurity books and I've read some other uh, books, but um, my son is reading The Cult of the Dead Cow, and that's like an older, you know, cybersecurity book. He's reading it for a cybersecurity class, and so I'm starting to read into that. I've been reading some other uh, books before that, but it's it's really pretty interesting and I'm, it brings back a lot of uh, memories. So that's kind of interesting. I don't know, have you heard of the Cult of the Dead Cow? I mean, it's no, something like way I haven't. long ago. And a lot of these things evolve from early days in cybersecurity, like bulletin board systems before real internet. It was more dial up and mm -hmm. all of that when I was really young. <laughs> yeah, I remember those. Uh, uh, those coupled with uh, with IRC. I think that was uh, yeah, absolutely. The yeah, first, IRC. Yeah, first platform that uh, that enabled us to communicate with one another. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, where 
almost at an end here. So let me just take this opportunity to thank you, Eric, for taking the time, jumping on this uh, quick podcast. I'm hope. I'm hopeful that your uh, answers would provide some insights to our listeners, and I hope uh, I hope you you had a pleasant time uh, being here and, and talking with me. And uh, and uh, and thank you again. All the best. Yeah, absolutely. Good to talk to you, Ben. And uh, you know, hopefully, someone got some maybe entertainment value out of this, or or maybe some uh, you know career advice or something like that along the way. So definitely good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you again.